In this video, we're going to define the norms on a space of matrices. So let K be a field, either R or C, and E be the set of all matrices with Q lines and P columns with the elements that are in K. Now, this set E is a linear space on the field K. If you remember correctly your course on convergence integration and probability that took place last semester, we defined a, the possibility to, to equip linear spaces with a norm. Basically, a mapping that goes from E to R plus will be a norm if it satisfies three properties. The first one, which is separation, the second one, which is homogeneity, and the third one, which is called the triangle inequality. Now, if all three properties are met, then we say that N is a norm. Very often, we uh, note it with double bars uh, before and after X. Now, what we're going to do is to equip the space of matrices, which is a linear space, as we just said, with a norm. And for reasons that will become obvious later, we'll actually using, use three bars instead of two. So the mapping with the three bars from uh, the set of matrices with Q lines and P column to R plus will be a norm if it satisfies the properties of a norm, separation, homogeneity, and triangle inequality. Now, I don't say anything new here. I mean, that's something that you already know from CIP. I mean, really, there is nothing new, nothing new so far. Now, it is possible that X and AX are themselves in a linear space, equipped with norms that I will denote with double bars. Now, we will say that the norm of the space of matrices that I denoted with three bars will be subordinated if we have this property AX smaller than this norm on the matrices with triple bars A times the norm of X. Another definition is submultiplicativity. Uh, we'll say that the norm is submultiplicative if the norm of the product, A of AB in this case, is smaller than the norm of A times the norm of B. Now, I'm going to come back to uh, this definition now to actually explain uh, how we're going to define the norm of a matrix that is useful for what we want to do. So consider KP and KQ, if you prefer RP and RQ, you can always generalize to C later, and you equip RP and RQ with a norm. Now, A is a matrix with Q lines and P columns, which means it will represent a linear mapping from RP to RQ. Now, if you take any X which is not zero, you can be interested in what is the gain, what is the amplification uh, of that vector of the norm of X in the direction of X. In other words, if you take a vector X and you apply A to it, so X is in R is in RP, and the image will be in RQ, right? So you basically take this vector and you apply A to it. So it might change direction, unless it's, an, unless it's an eigenvector, it will change direction, so it's here, and then it will do that. And the norm will change, right? I mean, it might be, long, it might, it might be longer, it might be shorter. So the question is, what will be the gain, what will be the amplification of the norm in the direction of X? Well, that, that, that's a question, and that is simply given by the norm of AX divided by the norm of X. So that's, that, that's simple. But now, let me uh, just point out that the uh, amplification, the gain, will vary when I change the direction, right? If I change the direction, then the amplification uh, of that vector, of the norm of this vector, will actually change depending on the direction. So it is reasonable to ask this question, what is the possible maximum gain I can get from A? In other words, is there a direction where I will get a, 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 a will amplify the norm the most? Okay, what is this maximal possible gain? All right, well, let me give you a definition uh, and then a remark and a proposition. Uh, that maximum gain obviously will be the supremum of the norm of AX divided by X for all non-zero X. 
and that will be a norm on the space uh, MQP. That will be a norm. And we will call this norm the induced norm. Induced by what? Induced by the norm with two bars I have just considered here, right? Uh, so that is the norm, th that is a norm uh, on the space of matrices. And again, I would like to stress that this induced norm will depend on the norm you have chosen on RP and RQ. Uh, if you have chosen a norm 2 or norm 1 or norm infinity, it will change that amplification. I mean, the, 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 the amplification uh, measure will be different because obviously you compute the norm differently. Okay? So that is what we call an induced norm. Now, the induced norm is obviously subordinated to, well, the norm that I've considered, right? I mean, because the supreme of Ax divided by norm of x will, will satisfy that uh, Ax will be smaller than this norm, which I denote with three bars, times the norm of x. And the other thing you can verify is that the induced norm is sub-multiplicative. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, let's consider q equals p, q equals r, and let me consider the norm infinity on RQ. Uh, as you know, it's uh, very simply de defined. I mean, if you consider X in RQ, then the norm infinity is the maximum of all possible absolute values of XI for I in between uh, 1 and Q. Now, the norm infinity of the matrix will be defined by this. Uh, the max on, uh, for I between 1 and Q of the sum of the a, i, j, which are the components of the matrix a. And basically, I take the absolute values of the a, i, j. In other words, it is the maximum absolute raw sum of the matrix. Uh, well, you can verify this easily. Uh, the proof is actually pretty simple. What you can say is that the infinity norm of a, x is, well, the maximum, by definition of the norm infinity, of the absolute value of the component of Ax, uh, basically the, the component of the line j, the jth component of Ax, of the vector Ax, for all possible j's between 1 and q. And of course, you can write this simply uh, with, well, the product of the matrix and the vector, and this is what you get. Now, obviously, uh, this will be smaller than the maximum for all possible i between 1 and q of the sums of the absolute values of the components of the matrix at line uh, i and column j multiplied by uh, x, j, and uh, absolute value, obviously, you, you do the sum here. And this x, j in, in absolute value is itself smaller than the norm infinity of x. So I can actually just do this, uh, this bound here, uh, bound above by the absolute value, uh, by, the, by, the, by the norm infinity of x, and just pull this out of the sum and the max. Now, obviously, when I have this, I can, def I, 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 can, I, can, I can compute easily the norm infinity of ax divided by the norm infinity of x. That is simply, uh, that, that maximum of sum for i equals 1 to q of the absolute values of a i j, which in turn tells me that the norm infinity of a will be smaller than this max. And now all I have to do is to find a x for which I have equality, and as you think about that, it's very easy to do. So, uh, what I'm saying here is that we can actually have a formula to compute the norm infinity of the matrix A, which is subordinated to uh, the norm infinity on RQ. I could do the same thing if instead of choosing the norm one, uh, infinity, I was to choose the norm 1, and here's what I would get. I would, that would change slightly the formula, as you can see. We're not talking about the maximum absolute column sum of the uh, matrix. All right. Now, I could also choose the norm 2 on RQ, right? The Euclidean norm. And if I was to do this, then the norm uh, on the matrix will be slightly more complicated. Uh, basically, the induced norm uh, would be the largest singular value of the matrix. And just as a reminder, the singular value of A 
is the square root of the eigenvalues of a transposed times a. So it's a little bit more complicated to compute uh, because obviously I need to well multiply um, a by its I mean by, by its trans transposed, but what I need to do then is to compute the eigenvalues, so that can be a little problematic if you have large matrices, uh, then that can take some time and that can be complicated. Uh, we have some good news coming up, so uh, don't be too depressed at this point, we're going to have uh, a way to work around this problem. And the way to work around this problem is uh, going to require that I introduce the Frobenius uh, inner product, on the space of matrices. So uh, if you consider uh, the space of matrices, uh, which as we said is a linear space and even a normed space, I can actually uh, I can actually define an inner product on this uh, on this space. And here is the inner product. I basically take all the elements of A, the first matrix, all the elements of B, the second matrix, and I just multiply each of them, and I just sum these multiplications. Now, what you can see is simply that you take your matrix, you flatten it, and you do the usual inner product that you have in uh, the space RQP, right? Uh, so that is called the Frobenius inner product, uh, and obviously we can also define it on uh, the space, uh, if, I, if I consider the, the, the field of complex numbers, all I have to do is to do conjugate of uh, Aij or Bij, it doesn't really matter, uh, and, and then I will be able to define a Frobenius inner product for that field. All right, and as you know, when I have a Hilbert space or pre-Hilbert space or Euclidean space, I can define a norm, uh, and that norm is simply the square root of the inner product of the element with itself. So I can define the Frobenius norm uh, deriving from the inner product simply this way, and this uh, inner pro I mean, and this inner product giving me a norm. This norm is sub-multiplicative. All right, now, the, I said we had some, so, so some good news coming up. The good news is here. Uh, if I consider the norm 2, uh, the, the norm which is induced by the Euclidean, by the Euclidean norm on, RP, on, on, on RQ, uh, you know, the one that was complicated to compute for the matrices. So if I, if I look at this complicated norm on, on, on the matrices, which is induced by the norm 2 on RP and RQ, and if I consider the Frobenius norm, which I just, just described, then we have that the norm 2 is bounded above by the Frobenius norm. And again, the Frobenius norm is extremely easy to compute because all you need to do is to compute the inner product of the matrix which itself. In other words, you square all the elements of the matrix, you add that up, and you turn the square root of it. So it's very easy to compute, and that will bound above the norm 2 of the matrix. So, so this will give me a simple way to estimate a bound of Ax in norm 2, uh, basically using this formula.